Okay, guys, uh, welcome. Uh, I have CJ Howhey with me from Northern Ireland, uh, and he is going to be talking with us about how he just crossed uh, the 10K per month, per month mark for the first time. Uh, he started dabbling with freelancing back in kind of 2010, 2011, but only really just started treating it like a serious pursuit back in 2017. So within a three-year time window, he has crossed the 10K month mark, and we're going to just dive in and and uh, and find out, uh, you know, how he did it and what his journey has looked like over the last uh, three years. Uh, so welcome, CJ. Thanks for hopping on with me. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks for the intro. I'm glad to be here. Totally. So can you can you kind of just walk us through your journey? Like when, uh, what sort of, what really made you want to get serious about freelancing back in 2017? And and what did the start of that journey look like for you? Yeah, cool. No problem. Um, so like I graduated in journalism back in 2010. But that was, I was just getting a degree and getting out of college. And I just wanted to go traveling. And I spent like seven years basically traveling. I was bouncing around. I was in Australia, New Zealand, all over the place. Um, and along the way, I'd done so many different jobs. But... You know, I was in bars, I was in offices, I was in call centers, but nothing clicked, like nothing. I didn't want to do any of these jobs. They were just a, a paycheck. And I ended up in South Korea in 2015 to teach English. And that was kind of like, um, it was kind of like a last roll of the dice for my travel. And I thought, <laughs> I'm going to go here, I'm going to make some money, and then I'll do South America. That was my big dream. I had to do South America. Okay. And after that, if, if I don't love teaching English, then I guess I'm just going to join the real world and get some job, you know, <laughs> some nine to five reluctantly. Um, and I didn't love in, teaching English. I, I discovered that pretty quickly. But um, <laughs> while I was in South Korea, I don't know if you've taught English or I'm sure plenty of other people will relate to this, that when you teach English out there, the lifestyle and the, the work demands and um, they allow you a lot of free time and with my free time that's where I started to poke my head into the blogosphere and started to like figure out what's this all about I started with like a travel blog and from that that's when I get interested in you know I wanted to understand how do people actually get websites to appear on page one of google so I just went down that rabbit hole really um, oh, really? And from there, yeah, that, that's, I started trying to figure out how can I make money out of this? And it was, I left Korea in 2017 to do my big trip to South America with whatever, I don't know, I had like five, 5K saved. So I was going to go to South America with my 5K and whenever the, the money ran out, I wanted to, I wanted to keep going. So that's when I thought, right, I'm going to make this freelance and it's either going to work or it's going to feel horribly and I'm going to be stuck in Bolivia in some alleyway, you know, but I was going to give it my best shot. Totally. So that's where it started, really. Awesome. And what did kind of, what did kind of getting serious about it look like? Like what did, uh, you know, from a, hey, we're just sort of dabbling our toes into the water till now I'm, I'm actually going to go on after this. What did that transition look like? What were you, what were you actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis to go pursue this in a more serious way? Um, initially, it was just about joining as many platforms as possible, like all the, the job platforms, you know, the ones like Upwork. Totally. Uh, I don't think TopTal was around at that time, but it was mainly like Upwork, Freelancer.com, and there's a few others. Yeah. And I was just posting, like, you know, I was pitching, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 jobs a day for, for real low money. But it just, it was like desperation, really. It was yeah. like, I gotta, I gotta get one of these, like, you know. Totally. So, um, it was that situation. And only because there, were, there was no other option. It was yeah. my partner, Diana, and I were doing this together. And we started off in Bolivia. And we were just like, we have to do this if we don't get jobs if we don't get money this the shit's gonna hit the fan here so totally just had to. totally so what did that what did that first year look like can you walk us through kind of 
you know, uh, what did some of those first gigs look like? You know, by six months into this, about what, how much money per month were you making? What did kind of, what did that process from, you know, day one to 12 months in look like? Um, man, it, it was real, you know, we were like flying by the seat of our pants kind of stuff. I wasn't like, totally. there was no systems, there was no tracking of invoices. So it, it's hard to really tell you exact figures, but sure. I'd, say, <laughs> I'd say in those first few months, man, it was, it, it was just real feast for fam and stuff. Like maybe if we made 300 bucks or 400 bucks in a month, we thought, yeah, this is, this is going somewhere. But, yeah. um, like the first job I got on Upwork. Actually, it was decent. It was it for some reason it worked out like hourly. I think it was thirty bucks an hour. I sat my rate up, and um, yeah, it was posting for posting blogs for some NFL college recruiter. Nice. Um, and it, it kind of backfired. It, it turns out the guy had I think I had mentioned something about this in Right Minds. Um, the guy had been previously banned from Upwork, so when it came to pay me. After doing all the work, it just suddenly everything got shut down and my, my account was suspended. And then when I, when I managed to get it reactivated, I was like, start from scratch. And there was no sign of that, that client who's gone. Oh, was my like, God. Did you, did you get paid for it at least? Yeah. I mean, I, I really harassed Upwork until they paid me. Nice. <laughs> like I, I sent Way to go. <laughs> I, I got paid, but it kind of soured everything with Upwork and... I just figured out, no, the only way this is really going to work is by working directly with clients. Um, and it was shortly after, it was maybe like, uh, say like four months in that we landed, uh, it was an agency we found on Upwork and then we started working directly with this agency. Nice. Um, and that came up the perfect time because we moved from Bolivia to Chile where the, the cost of living in Chile was just, you know, much higher. We were like, okay. That we really need something and it just that agency came along at the perfect time nice um and that, that was the beginning of 2018 probably like four months three four months into full-time freelancing okay um january 18 and then it, then it was pretty steady work the agency was consistent which was great they were reliable you there was always work coming but uh yeah looking back now man it was it was just a content mill. I don't want to. I don't want to yeah. mention them. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. But yeah, yeah, I wasn't a fan of that agency by the end. <laughs> I, I always think of I always think of agencies as being like potentially one step up from like random upward gigs. But it's like it's a pretty small step, and you don't realize how poorly you're being paid and how ridiculous the terms often are until after you've been working with you know, one-to-one -one clients that you land directly for a while. And then you look back and go, that wasn't nearly as good as the gig as it felt like at the time, you know, but at the time they can be really good stepping stones. Oh, man, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Um, like one of the first jobs I got with that agency, uh, I was working directly with the CEO and um, they were launching a new course a content strategy course, which was this like six week course. They were selling it at like a thousand bucks or nine, nine, seven. And they got me to, to write the landing page for this course. And like, and three months into my, my freelance career, I didn't know what I to <laughs> charge for a landing page. Not that I had any say in the matter. They just said, this is the project. This yeah. is the free. It was like 150 bucks for this big, big landing page. And, uh, to hey, that's this good day, practice. That's to good this practice. day, that that CEO is still using that same land page to, to sell her thousand dollar course. I got a hundred fifty wow. bucks. <laughs> that's amazing. Hey, good yeah. good portfolio piece, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I look back now, I'm like, damn, I could have charged a lot more for that. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so what came, how long were, were you with working with this particular agency? Um, so we were working, we were working with them for about a year. Okay. Full, yeah, it was about 12 months from January, 2018. They were like our, they were 80% of our income. Um, my partner and I both. And by January, 2019, the two of us, 
uh, parted ways with him. Okay. And, and over that time, were you actively tr getting other gigs or just taking things here and there off Upwork? What was, what was going on during that year? Um, so yeah, we, we both, both of us tried to build, we built like basic portfolio websites, one page kind of stuff. Nice. Um, they weren't very good. They didn't attract leads. We didn't do a lot of like, marketing around that. But we did continue pitching on Upwork and I, by July of that year, so so probably like eight months into my freelance, full-time freelancing, uh, I landed two more clients off Upwork and then I immediately took them off up, you know, off that platform to work directly with them. Yeah. And I still have those two clients today. And, oh, awesome. Um, yeah, one of them has been a steady uh, source of blog work, like every week, like clockwork. And the other has has was give me the platform to learn about copywriting. They give me their web design company and every website that they do, they hire me as their, their copywriter for those new websites. And um I'm still I'm working on a big job for them right now. So they have been That's awesome. really reliable clients for the last two, two and a half years. That's awesome. Uh and then kind of heading to the end of the relationship with that that big agency. Uh what came next after that, after you stopped working with them? Was that a situation where it just kind of like fell off or did you re actively replace them with a better thing or kind of what, what happened there? Um, so I, I started to, I started to poke around or like do a bit more research around other freelancers, you know, um, Googling like top copywriters, top, digital marketing writers and stuff. And that might have been how I actually first discovered your website. Um, okay. And others like, um, like Elise Dobson. Totally. And, um, it's a few others that don't spring to mind now, but I just want, I wanted to get an idea of what their websites looked like, what they were actually charging, and how they found other clients. And um, from that, then I started to get an idea of, the kind of companies that I might be able to pitch. Um, and it is true that then I started to actually approach our companies with these weak ass pitches, but like <laughs> you, know, you throw enough mud at a wall, it'll stick. And uh, I did eventually land one or two. Um, one, it was about this time last year I landed was Single Green. Oh yeah. Um, and that was like a big step up. Like that was, easily double whatever I was charging then. I think I was, I think I had maybe one client. I had started to, to ease my, or get up to like kind of 10 cents a word by about last July, August, or not the last, sorry, August 2018. Um, and then, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Stop. Um, as I, as we, Left the agency, I was maybe 10 cents a word or something like that. Um, and then it was January 2019, we parted ways with the agency. And I, I'd got a couple of clients, maybe around the 10 cents a word mark. After leaving the agency, I'm just going to say, there, there, it wasn't a, the most amicable, amicable of split. <laughs> um, I felt a little hard done by for a few reasons. Um, cause we, we, you know, we grind for that. We, we did a lot of grinding for that agency yeah. and it, it was thankless. Um, so after that, I was like, all is fur and love and war now. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I, I was aware of several of their clients having worked pretty much directly with the clients. Yeah. I'd already struck up connections with some of those clients through LinkedIn and stuff. And uh, yeah, I, I just basically started talking to them and end up working directly with some of those clients. So nice. maybe cool. there, there's some morality issue there or whatever, but I didn't care in the end. <laughs> I like, honestly, my two cents with that is there's not, because the reality is there's, there's two possible scenarios. Either the agency is bringing strategy and all these other things that a large team needs to provide to give them extra value to make it worth to stay with the agency, or they're just basically charging them for writing and taking a huge cut out of it while paying you, you know, 
nothing. And so yeah. if you go directly to the writer or to the you know client and they're both, and it's just a writing exchange, they're getting a better deal, you're making a better rate. Exactly. Like, exactly. You know, like that's the risk. If you're gonna be a, if you're gonna be an extract a value extraction player in the market where you don't actually add any value of your own, like a lot of these agencies are, that's the risk you take. So like you know, like you said, all spare and love war in business, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, yeah. yeah. That's what we thought anyway, and it, it worked out for us. And um, yeah, I wasn't really sorry to leave the agency in the end. I mean, at, at the highest rate, that agency was five cents a word. So uh, you're not, you're never going to grow. As you said earlier, like I think agencies, uh, content models, they're just a stepping stone. Totally. Uh, and kind of, kind of from then. So, so that was, that was about a year and a half then. So was that about a year ago, a year and a half ago? Uh, yeah, that was the start of, the start of last year. So okay. I left it, started the agency 2018, <laughs> left it January 2019. And so then it was like not only full-time freelancing, but free of all platforms, all the agencies. It was like, now I got to start like pitching and you rely on referrals and stuff. So this, yeah. So that, that's sort of where you transitioned into the style of freelancing that I primarily teach of direct outreach, branding yourself, leveraging referrals. Talk right. to me about from there till now, what has kind of that, what has that journey looked like? Has it been a fairly gradual stacking of like blog writing clients? Has it been, you know, has there been a little bit of an up and down? Has it been a kind of finding opportunities here and there? What's, what's that journey looked like for you? Yeah, sure. Um, so trying to get the dates right. Yeah, we were, we came back, like we had been in South America for a while, we came back 2018 Christmas um, to Ireland, and then we were back again, we went back to Colombia in February 2019, but unlike before where we were hopping around, backpacking, you know, freelancing was kind of like this side hustle just to afford the next, you know, the next trip or the next bus ticket or the next hostel, we went back in February 2019, we got one place in, in Colombia. We rent an apartment, dropped our bags, unpacked. We were like, we are here to work full time and, and save money. So nice. it jumped up another level, really, the freelancing. And from there, from February 2019, I, I seen like a steady cons increase in my income, like month on month. And that was purely, I had a base and I was like fully focused. And, I had a few clients, but I just always wanted to like get up to the next client. So I was actively asking for referrals. I spent a little time doing a new portfolio website. And then I got, I reached out to all my clients from past and present. Love and it. got like a good testimonial from like as many as possible. Um, Killer. So that built up my website. So at least that before, like if I directed some new prospect to my website, I was almost embarrassed. There was nothing there. And it was just like, you know, why am I gonna get them to look at this piece of shit? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I actually got a, a portfolio site that I wasn't, you know, I could actually use. It was like a, a marketing tool. It would add a little bit of weight, a little bit of credibility to any of my claims. And I had some of my published, you know, anywhere I had a byline, I had it on this website. And, um, so yeah, from there, from February 2018, I did try to use that website and testimonials to just keep getting new clients. And um, as you are a proponent for, like every time you get a new client, you know, you then have a little bit of weight that you can start to renegotiate with your existing clients. And it's like, you're just trying to like stack everything up and just try and raise the rates with everybody. And Totally. And yeah, bump off the cheapest one. The, and when you, so. Totally stair step the pricing up. And were you, when, when you say when I would be talking with a new potential client and send them to the site, where are those people coming from? Are those people coming from uh, cold outreach? Are those people coming from warm outbound, you know, outreach? Are those people coming from referrals? Are they coming from 
some sort of inbound marketing like LinkedIn? Uh, where, where, are, where are all those people coming from and, and what would be the biggest out of those buckets? What would have been, what, do you, what would you say was the biggest bucket for you? Initially, probably the first half of 2019 was me. Um, it was outreach on my behalf, probably. Killer. I didn't really look at uh, Upwork anymore. My main source actually became Pro Blogger, the, the job board. On Pro oh, that Blogger. job board. Okay, cool. Um, that was like the only, like I left other job boards, but Pro Blogger tends to be some good ones on there. You have to look for them. But, that was. Um, that was my favorite when I still was doing job boards was definitely pro blogger by far. Yeah. I think, I think it's because people have to pay to advertise there. Like I'm yep. pay a little bit more, you pay like 70 bucks to advertise a job for two weeks. Yeah. So I figure that if people are paying writers really low. They're not even going to bother uh, posting their, their job ad on pro yep. blogger. So, um, Initially, yeah, I, I was pitching there and whenever a client or a prospect emailed me and asked me a little bit more, I would then send them to my site or, or maybe it was in the initial pitch or application of like, you can find out a little bit more about me here on my site. And that, that was usually enough to get me that email response, like just after they looked at my site, seen the testimonials, seen my samples, then I had my in from there. and. Um, yeah, I built up through 2019 that way. And it was then towards the end of 2019 that I landed that, that job with Single Grain. Um, and yeah, that, that was a big job. Did Single Grain, I, I would guess that you didn't find them through a job board. Um, is that correct? Or was, did they post on a job board? Uh, it was kind of weird, actually. Um, I think I seen it. It was... I think it was Elise Dobson's website. I seen she had wrote, written for Single Grain, and I seen her rates on her page, and I, I just put two and two together. I was like, okay, they they can't be paying peanuts like that. <laughs> so yeah, so you reached like, out to them. Yeah, I reached out to them um, somehow. I can't remember through LinkedIn, and then I got to talking to somebody like an editor, but then. Sure, in that same period, they did actually post uh, an ad on Job Blogger, her okay. Pro Blogger. So uh, I was like, "Sweet, they, they're looking for somebody." So I just, I just opt the ante with them. Then that's hilarious because Single Grain is actually. I tell a story sometimes about a company that I saw an ad of theirs on Facebook and clicked through the ad and pitched the company. Uh, and it was, it was single grain and, and Eric, their CEO responded to me. It was when they were pretty small. Uh, and so I ended up working with them for a little bit. Uh, but that, that, that's hilarious. That it was both the, through kind of random means we both target ended up targeting that same company. Now they're going to get a whole bunch of emails after this video comes out. But, <laughs> uh, but, but just, I mean, honestly, what you described there is something I've, you know, I probably don't talk about it as often as I should, but I, it's, it's something I teach in my course and that I've, you know, occasionally referenced, which is, you know, if you're writing in a niche, look, look at the top writers, look for the top writers in the niche, the ones who are charging the top rates and look at all the brands that they're writing for. Cause those are the companies that are paying brands, a, you know, a high rate. And if you can do top quality work, you can get a top quality, you know, price from them. Cause you know, People like Elise, people like myself, at this stage in our career, we almost never do unpaid guest posts anymore. We did a lot of them early on, but we no longer, you know, do stuff like that. So if we're if we're working with someone, they're paying a top rate. So if you can, you know, if you can find people like, you know, people like us, people whoever the whoever the Elise is in your niche and see what are the brands that they're you know, that they've been writing for in the last few years, you immediately know, Hey, these are all people who are willing to pay great rates for writing. So love that. Love, love to how the, uh, you reached out to them initially and then you even saw the job post on the back end. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. it was like, you, you can't say no now. I know, I, know yeah, I, know, I know you're looking for a writer now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's awesome. So, so, okay. So obviously, you know, some, got some good clients there. Um, looking back over this last six month stretch, uh, where you crossed that, you know, five figure 10 K per month mark. 
uh, what's been going on in the last six months in particular that's kind of really helped, that's helped you clear that hurdle? Is it just sort of, you know, the same thing that happened the previous six months? You're just farther in the process or is there anything you've switched up, anything in particular you were targeting in on? Um, yeah, I, I did definitely make a few big changes this year. Um, so, so I had a kid, well, my partner had a kid in February. Oh, um, congrats. I basically, <laughs> I basically took February and March off. I didn't plan to, but I, like, um, Kai was born Valentine's Day. So I thought I'm going to go back to work like March 1st. But yeah. as you'll know, again, kids are... Right. Kids are <laughs> <laughs> uh. It was pretty crazy. I was just kind of like been super flexible for like the whole, like, well, all year. But like throughout March, especially, I didn't get a lot done. So I didn't really properly get back to work till April. And uh, by that point, I knew this, this is, just, I'm just going to burn out if I tried to do all this work myself. Um, so the first thing I did was I put some ads out on Facebook and I hired a couple of writers. And um, that was an absolute game changer. I mean, I was making pretty steady money throughout 2019, but it was always still just sort of, it was just middling. You know, I, I could see myself plateauing. Um, but once I had the writers, man, that, that just opened up whole new possibilities of, of earning and uh, work-life balance. Because there, yeah. there's only so many words one person can write. Totally. So, so for those who aren't really familiar with sort of how, you know, that might work, they hear, oh, hey, I'm a freelance writer and I'm hiring other writers and they maybe don't understand what that model looks like. Can you describe sort of how, how you're utilizing that to help you earn more? Yeah. Um, so like if you say I've got, I probably have a 10 active clients now. Um, and I've kind of got them in like a tiered system. So when I hire a writer, I'll bring them in at the lower tier. And that, when I say a tiered system, I mean like according to what the re the clients pay me, I just put them like my top class, lower, and the, the lowest clients, like that's where I'll, I'll bring in a writer and train them up. Um, for me, like it, the writer's main goal or main purpose is just to provide like a first draft. So I provide a brief, I get a brief from my client. I'll add my own notes. I might even do the research part. I might bring in a lot more research. I might include source links that the writer can use for their own additional research. And I'll just have the whole structure down and then I'll send that to the writer. They'll take at it and then they'll submit a first draft. And then I'll, I can, for a higher tier client, I might co-edit with them a little bit just to give the, the writer some feedback. But for the, the lower tier client, I'll just take that first draft, I'll pay the writer, and then I'll finish, polish it up, and move it on to the client. Totally. So you kind of have them do, kind of have them do the legwork of putting together that first draft, uh, mm -hmm. knowing that you know the, the finished product is not really going to be good enough to send to the client. Uh, but it helps take up a big time consuming piece for you. And as you edit it, you're kind of helping teach this writer how to get better and, you know, raise their rates. A lot of, uh, you know, if, if you're not, if you haven't heard of this concept before, this is a pretty common thing, especially for, for higher tier writers. Uh, you kind of like, you know, it's essentially if you're wanting to tackle several big pieces, especially in the long form space, um, you know, there's kind of different levels of, uh, there's different kind of types of how the writing gets done and having that first draft done, you know, it's still going to be a, a long way from something that could be presented to the writer, but it kind of works in this dual, almost like apprenticeship slash employment basis where you're, you know, you have these writers that you're teaching how to, uh, improve their writing to get, you know, they're seeing, they're getting their writing edited and they're getting to see the edits to say, to see, hey, this is the difference between, you can only go get you know five to 10 cents per word from a, a, an end user client right now. I'm showing you how to edit it up to be worth 40 cents per word. Uh, and so it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a, a synergistic relationship that you'll see quite a bit in, in the writing space. Um, but so what, made, what kind of encouraged you to you know, 
I know for a lot of, a lot of writers who probably are at the point where they should be doing that are scared to, because you're, you know, you're, you're eliminating a chunk of the return uh, by paying other writers to help you. What, what kind of motivated you to make that transition? Um, well, a big part was um, becoming a father um, because you didn't have the time. <laughs> I, didn't, yeah, I didn't have a lot of time, um, but also my, my partner, Diana, she's been on maternity leave before. Like it was like a partnership, an agency. Um, we had our own clients and then we had a few clients that we shared. So when she went on maternity leave, it was all on me. And yeah, I mean, I, not only did I feel motivated to like, uh, I need to step it up. I need to earn more um, just to like cover our costs. But I also, I wasn't happy. I, was, I wasn't satisfied with, you know, you know, there's nothing wrong with 3K, 4K a month. There's nothing wrong. That's great. But I wanted more, and I, I wanted more because I wanted to have, you know, as to sound cliche, a financial freedom. That's what I was aiming for. Totally. Um, that, that better work-life balance. And I didn't see how that was possible to do by myself, like, unless I was grinding like 60, 70 hours a week, pumping out five, eight, 10,000 words a day or something. Like that. So I just, I didn't want to do that. So yeah. I knew that I, it was worth hiring writers and giving them that cut. You know, it made it, it made the whole thing scalable. So. Totally. That's awesome. And kind of looking back, uh, looking back on the, the last three years, uh, if you, uh, was, is there anything that you would have done different uh, along the way? Is there anything that you think like, oh, you know, maybe if I had jumped to this quicker, I could have, you know, shortened the journey or, you know, maybe I, I put up with, with that client way too long or, you know, any, any, any thoughts looking back? Um, yeah, well, a big, a big struggle for me is uh, time management and like productivity on, the, on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, I'm king procrastinator. Um, it's like Parkinson's law. If I have one thing to do, it'll take 30 minutes. I'll wait till like 4 p.m. to start it. And um, it's only... It's only this year I've really started to try and tackle that issue. Um, I mean, hiring writers means that you're, you're constantly dealing with these emails pinging in, like from different writers and doing different edits, and then you have to manage the clients and the writers at the same time. So I'm trying now over the last few months to really devise, you know, proper systems and processes and document everything and get everything just working like a well-oiled machine. And that's something I'm only starting to do now. Or if I feel if I had done that a year or two years ago, I'd, I'd be way above where I am now. Um, oh, I've also, just in the last couple of months, started to get up at 5 a.m. And that, that's that been massive help with uh, productivity, big time. Okay. Um, do, you, do you go to bed earlier too, I'm assuming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you just force uh, those extra hours out of the day. <laughs> no, like by by like nine p.m. I, I need like match sticks. <laughs> and and what uh, how do you feel that those morning hours have been more productive for you than say having the same you know same number of hours just pushed back later in the day? Um. Well, like I mean. The concept, like for me, it's just because the baby in the house, you know, if I, if I get up out of bed at 7 a.m. or 7.30, the, the chaos of the day takes over immediately. And yeah. you know, before you get to sit down and put your head into work, it's, it's nearly midday or something, you know? Yeah, I get, I get that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, I'm not saying that the 5 a.m. thing only applies if you have kids, because that, that wouldn't be true. Yeah. For me, I, I think it's... Um, I think it's about identifying the parts of the day when you're most productive. You know, you, everybody's got certain windows, you know, if you're a morning person or a night owl, or some people just get like, you know, spurts of productivity at random parts of the day. And for me, I, I always realize, I always have known for a while, while I've been freelancing, that I kind of like burn out or just have a real dip at like between like 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. So if, if I only start my day at nine, I'm with a baby, that really means if I only start my day at midday, I've only got like two hours of peak yeah. productivity. 
being in a crash. <laughs> so it's, it's no good. So um, 5 a.m. to like 7 a.m. I just, I love it. It's just, I, you know, like I heard a podcast about it. It's, it's nothing new, this concept. But like um, it was a podcast with this um, Robin Sharma guy who wrote the, the book, The 5 a.m. Club. Listen to this podcast, and I just, I just was sold. I drank the Kool Aid, and I was like, "I'm doing this." And it was, I think it was like the next day. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's let's see what what this is all about. Like, so um, yeah, I took a that was September first, and uh, it, I don't think it's any coincidence that September and October have been my two best months yet of freelance yeah. in in terms of income. Totally, it's always funny. I I feel like uh, I drank the Kool Aid is like the preface for like some of the like most meaning, like the, the biggest wins of your life and potentially the biggest losses too, you know, it's like like nothing really changes unless you go all in on it, you know? Uh, And it's why, it's why I recommend when people like are thinking about getting a course or, you know, going into some program or making some big life change, like do your due diligence ahead of time and then go in all in like either go in all in or don't go in at all because you get most of the benefit when you just head down you know go all in on something fully embrace it that's where some that's where the biggest change comes from um and you don't so you don't you don't want to go in skeptical you want to do you know be skeptical ahead of time and then decide okay this is for me i'm going all in and then you know let the let's see see where the results take you oh definitely totally agree with that um, like before this year, I, got, I was doing okay. Like I said, maybe like three, four K or something average per month. But I, I always, I still had that that weird attitude where I'd sit on the sidelines. I'd see these courses advertised and look at the price of like 300 bucks or 500 bucks. And I'm like, nah, no, nah, that, that doesn't really work. Or like I'd read a blog about, oh, you need to be on LinkedIn to, to like build your network. I'm like, nah, nah. That, that doesn't work. You know, that works for other people or something like that. And, but it, it was only this year, like then I thought, fuck it, I'm going to actually try these things and then I can decide if it works for me. And so yeah. like the 5 a.m. thing is just one example. I, LinkedIn I, was another thing I got into this year for the first yeah. time. Um, back in April, I started like, I'm going to start posting every day or five days a week. I've fizzled out a little bit lately, but that's only because... It worked. Yeah. <laughs> and so I had to stop. <laughs> totally. And uh, the same with courses. Um, I bought a few courses over the last month or two. Um, and like I spent like a thousand bucks in the last couple of months on courses and yep. learned a lot of stuff that I'm now putting to good use. So totally. Yeah, you, you have to actually try these things. You know, if you sit on the sidelines, yeah, you, you'll always be sitting on the sidelines. So yeah. So kind of like this has kind of been the year of of going all in on, you know, know, like you said, 5 a.m., right minds. Uh, You grab my course, some other courses as well. Just basically going, you know, we've made it work till now, but now now we're in now we're moving from it's working mode to like, let's actually build what we want out of life, you know, intentionally and with the resources available. Yeah, that's it. Like, I mean all the resources are available to build whatever kind of career you want. Well, in terms of freelancing, remote work, like it's, yeah. it's really all there for you at the touch of a button. And it's just a matter of actually applying yourself and walking out them steps. So. <laughs> oh, you want a different one? Hey buddy. There we go. Speaking of a, uh, productivity killers <laughs> but they're so cute <laughs> yeah they definitely are man. <laughs> yeah i gotta go get this kid situated but hey thanks for hopping on man uh super appreciate you going through your journey this was great stuff yeah no worries i appreciate it thanks for uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity i uh, enjoyed it totally man yeah it was great chatting and uh, i will see you in right minds well do buddy all the best Take care.